Today, from Philip DeCourcy on Know the Truth. When it comes to the Bible, some of us can come and we just flutter from one verse to the next, kind of skimming across the top of God's Word. Some of us are a little bit more serious than that. We have got notebooks that are full of biblical truth, but still we don't take anything away. Hearing its truth, obeying its truth, it is the words and the Word of the living God. It's easy to impress people by storing up facts about the Bible. Perhaps you can recount all the alliterations your pastor used in his last sermon. Maybe you know a lot of theological terminology. But is this really what it means to receive God's Word? Today on Know the Truth, our topic is expository listening. Pastor Philip DeCourcy explains that it's not about sitting through a sermon or memorizing key words. It's about being transformed by the Word. Now, here's Philip DeCourcy. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Under the general thought of no mere words, we're looking at the Word of God, its character, and our relationship to it. And if you remember back, we've been working our way through this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 16. And Paul is giving thanks to God for how the Thessalonians embraced the gospel. And in this chapter, he's uh, focusing on their reception of God's Word. Paul gives thanks for the fact that they gladly received it. They welcomed it. They embraced it. And we pause to reflect on that, that you and I need to be those who gladly receive and effectively embrace the preaching of God's Word. We called ourselves to become expository listeners. There needs to be a cooperation between the preacher and the listener. The preacher needs to study hard and speak well, but the congregation needs to prepare themselves thoroughly, and they need to listen eagerly. Expository listening involves passion. It involves petition. Remember, we got to this point. This is where we're kind of picking up where we left off. Expository listening involves prostration, humility, and a submission before and to the Word of God. We need to have the spirit of little Samuel back in 1 Samuel 3 verses 1 through 10. Lord, speak for your servant hears. We need to come with our ears bent and our wills bent towards the hearing of God's Word. Some time ago, I, I read a commentary on the book of Hebrews by Jerry Vines, a Southern Baptist pastor and expositor, and then he, he brought in an interesting thought. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 through 13, here's what we read about the Word of God. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I want you to notice that word in verse 13, open. It's a Greek word that gives us our word, tracheotomy. And what's interesting, Jerry Vines helped me to see this, that there was an ancient practice of putting a sword to the throat of someone that had been captured. The captor was in a place of humility, down on his face. And then the soldier or the monarch would take a sword and put it under their chin, the point of the sword, to the apple of the throat, causing them to lift their head and gaze into the face of the king. What a challenging picture. When God uses His Word through the preaching of it, the sword of the Spirit is put to our throat, and we're caused to look into the face of Him with whom we have to do. And there needs to be a spirit of humility and submission. Listen, throughout Scripture, listening is equated to obeying. Let me just give you a couple of examples. 
These two ideas are never separated. They're like Siamese twins. In Exodus 15, verse 26, what do we read? If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. If you hear and obey, then I'll bless you. That's a theme that's just carried out throughout the Word of God. You get it again in Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verses 3 and 4, where God says to Israel again, Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You shall diligently teach these statutes to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit down and when you walk in the way. There's a hearing and a doing, a hearing and an observing. In fact, the Greek word for obey literally means to hear under. It's to submit to authority. It's to comply with certain statutes. You and I need to grasp that. Expository listening involves petition, passion, prostration, preparation. Coming to Sunday morning and the exposition of Scripture ought not to be a cold start for any one of us. You ought to come with your engine running. You've prayed about the service. You've prayed for the message. You've prayed for the pastor. You've prayed for yourself. You've raked yourself over the coals of God's Word. You've humbled yourself. You've brought every thought into captivity. You're all ear to the voice of the master. There's a willingness to obey. And when you come like that, your worship experience will be heightened and multiplied. What do we read of the Bereans that they received the word with all readiness? Acts 17, verse 11. You and I need to come to hear the Word of God mentally focused, physically alert, and spiritually engaged. What does that look like? Well, number one, you need to prioritize your week, making the hearing of God's Word central. This is the hour around which your whole week should revolve. The meeting of the people of God. The Lord's day coming together to break bread, coming together to pray, coming together to fellowship, coming together to hear the apostles' doctrine. Sunday should find you as it found John on the Isle of Patmos, Revelation 1 verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Seems to me that seeking first the kingdom of God entails making the first day of the week and the hearing of God's Word the hub of your week into which all the spokes go. For the most part, not getting legalistic or slavish here, but where you can, make it the habit to be home on a Saturday night. Make it a habit, maybe Saturday night, or certainly when you get up early on Sunday morning to rake yourself over the coals of God's Word, being all ear, praying for a good Sunday among the people of God. Organize your family the night before. Put the clothes out, get the things ready. Put the gas in the car, get up early. Help each other to come to the house of God in the right spirit. Get here early. Fellowship a little bit. Get into your seat and begin to quieten your heart down to hear the word of the living God, to get ready for the sword of the spirit, to be put to your throat, to look into the face of the king. Sports teams and athletes go through their pregame routine. I searched out a little this week and was interested to find that Curtis Martin, running back for the New York Jets, in the U.S. National Football League, he reads Psalm 91 before every game. Turk Wendell, formerly a pitcher in uh, the Major League Baseball uh, League, including the uh, Chicago Cubs and New York Mets, was known to have multiple rituals, including brushing his teeth between every innings. It's a bit odd, isn't it? Basketball superstar Michael Jordan always wore his North Carolina college shorts under his Chicago Bulls uniform. World-class tennis player Rafael Nadal of Spain has to have his water bottles all lined up with the labels facing the baseline from which he's playing. They've all got their little pre-game routine. What's your pre-game routine? What do you do on a regular basis? 
to prepare yourself for the Word of the living God. Well, I think uh, preparation not only involves prioritizing our week and making the hearing of God's Word on the Lord's Day a priority, I think it involves perhaps a media fast. Too many people come to church red-eyed from Nintendo or television or late-night movies or other forms of social media. Let's be honest about it. The average Christian watches too much television. One study shows that Christians spend seven times more time watching television than they do participating in Bible reading, prayer, and worship. The devil is a thief. John 10, verse 10. And undoubtedly, he uses media in general, television perhaps in particular, as a tool to rob us of our ability to enjoy a close-up and personal relationship with God. The reality is that exposure to media or overexposure makes us physically lazy. It's a very passive thing, isn't it? It disorders our morals given most of the storylines. It reduces our critical powers. For the most part, it's pretty shallow and superficial and doesn't make you think. It confuses our perception of what is real because we go in and out of real and unreal situations. It flitters away our time, and more than anything, it subtly conforms us to the world. We've got to decrease our intake of any media source that affects our ability to hear and think and understand and come with a mind that's open. Lazy thinking is unbecoming of the Christian. We need to love God with all our minds. Luke 10, verse 27. Did you come with all your mind? You get a good night's sleep. You're sharp. You're mentally alert. You're up for hearing 45 minutes of exposition. You're going to take the treasure and gold of God's Word home and think about it. You're going to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Again and again throughout the Psalms, we're told, right, to meditate. The blessed man of Psalm 1 is said to meditate upon God's Word night and day. You know that the idea of meditation is chewing on it, digesting its meaning, rolling over its ideas in one's mind. It's it's not treating the Word of God superficially. Ian Barclay, British pastor in London, wrote a wonderful little book I purchased some years ago called He Gives His Word, and and in it, he describes the owner of a beautiful garden. He imagines that one day this owner is sitting at his windowsill looking out the window, and his garden is visited by three different entities. First is a butterfly, and he watches the butterfly as it flutters from flower to flower, but it takes nothing away from the garden just hops from one petal to another. Next, he notices a botanist comes into his garden with a large notebook in his arm with an enormous magnifying glass in his hand and a net in the other. And he spends a considerable amount of time hunched over each of these flowers, inspecting them, taking all the information he can into his notebook. But the third visitor to the flower garden is a tiny little bee, busy little bumblebee who alights on a flower, who crawls down deeply into its bloom and flies away with the nectar it has garnished. And then he makes this application. When it comes to the Bible, are you a butterfly, a botanist, or a bumblebee? See, some of us can come and we just flutter from one verse to the next, kind of skimming across the top of God's Word. Well, some of us are a little bit more serious than that. We have got notebooks that are full of biblical truth. We're investigating word studies and theological ideas, but still we don't take anything away. Or are we more like the bee who really drills down into the Word of God, bringing our will beneath its will, hearing its truth, obeying its truth, living it, meditating upon it, every syllable, every sentence. It's a good picture, and it's a, it's a good thought. Well, hey, as we wrap up, one final thought here. 
Expository listening involves participation. Petition, passion, prostration, preparation, participation. I don't know if you've thought about that. Congregational worship is a great hearing aid to expository preaching. Expository preaching and listening is aided by you being in the company of God's people. Biblical learning, according to the Bible, and I'll show you a couple of verses that substantiate this, is a shared experience in the best of circumstances. Hearing the Word of God with the redeemed people of God helps open our ears and minds, I think, more than sometimes even individual study. Church worship provides a fire that kindles our devotion to Christ. And let me say this, there are unique experiences of God that's reserved for the private place. But conversely, I believe, there are unique experiences of God reserved for the public place, for the coming together of God's people. God gives a deep and wonderful understanding of Himself that I think sometimes is not found outside the fellowship of the saints. Ephesians 3, 18 to 19 says, what comprehend with all the saints, the love of God, its height, its depth, its breadth. Colossians 3, verse 16 tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, speaking to one another, admonishing one another, teaching one another. Both those verses seem to say that there's a learning, there's an instruction that takes place regarding God in the company of God's people that's unequaled, if we were by ourselves. I dare to say, and don't misunderstand me, that we may have overemphasized the quiet time in the church. Because again and again in the New Testament, the call is to come to be with God's people. The preaching is corporate. The gathering is corporate. The learning is corporate. That's why you've got the one another's all over the New Testament. Because I think I get to know God in the company of God's people in a way I don't experience by myself. I'm stirred up to the good work of hearing and heeding the Word of God when I'm with others. Hebrews 10, we've already quoted it 24 to 25. I don't know if this is a great analogy, but, you know, we've all perhaps had the experience of maybe watching our favorite sports team on the easy chair at home with some popcorn, whatever. And we've all been to the actual stadium itself. From a boy, I loved Manchester United. I watched them every week on television at home. But around about the age of 15 to 16, with some friends, I made a trip, took the boat from Northern Ireland to Scotland and the bus down to Manchester. I'll never forget the day of walking through the streets of Manchester and then kickoff time was looming. We headed towards Old Trafford. As we came down the streets, thousands of other Manchester United fans streamed out into those thoroughfares. And then we got to the stadium, got inside, 60,000 screaming fans. I couldn't see the game as well up in those stands as I could see it at home, but the experience to me was far better. It was real time. It was alive. It was technicolor. I had sights and sounds and smells that I'd never get at home. And that day at Old Trafford, it was one of a number in my lifetime, is etched in my memory forever. And the feelings are good. I think there's something parallel in terms of you and I studying at home, maybe even watching a church service on the television, but compared to being in live worship with God's people. It's rather faint. It's only an approximation. And maybe the, an extension of that thought as we close is that surely if that's true, that participation with other saints helps us to grasp the Word of God better and indeed helps us in our expository listening experience, then you and I must never discount learning from those who preceded us. There is a qualified role for church tradition that conforms to the Word of God. 
We mustn't show our arrogance or our ignorance in ignoring 2,000 years of church history and the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of others, and they allow us to comprehend the love of God, dead saints and living saints. Spurgeon said that he thought that it was odd that some people think so much of what God has taught them, but so little of what God has taught others. It's a good challenge. It's a good thought. Have you got Matthew Henry's commentary? One volume. It was written over 300 years ago. I'd still recommend it to you. He wrote it over 300 years ago, and I'm still reading it. And if you read that one volume written over 300 years ago, when you start reading it, that's a man who drew from the well of Puritan thought across 100 years. And he kind of distilled it and concentrated it into his commentary. Just think, that's just one example of what we're talking about, of the tools and the blessings that are available to you and me. One commentary. 300 years ago, one man who distilled the thinking of many men across a hundred years. And you and I can go to that well and draw from it so we can be better expository listeners so that we can be like the Thessalonians who received the Word of God and welcomed it, not as the words of men, but as it truly is the Word of God which effectively works in us. That's their appropriation of God's Word. This is a book that's divine in its origin, that's God's autograph all over it. It's not the words of man. It is the words and the Word of the living God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the joy of Christian fellowship, the communion of the Spirit. We pray, Lord, that uh, we would embrace Paul's challenge to us as he gave thanks to God for how the Thessalonians received the Word, so might we be a means of encouraging those who preach the Word to us, teach the Word to us by the way we listen and by the way we learn. Lord, we pray for an increasing cooperation between the pulpit and the pew, for we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. An important reminder to be active listeners. This is Know the Truth with pastor and Bible teacher Philip DeCourcy. If you miss any portion of today's message, you can hear the program in its entirety when you visit our website. Go to ktt.org or download the free KTT app to your smartphone or tablet. And then look for the series called Classic Christianity More Than Mere Words. This series is all about growing our love for the Bible because it's so much more than just words. And as a companion to this study, Pastor Philip has selected a fantastic book to recommend. It's titled, How to Eat Your Bible, A Simple Approach to Learning and Loving the Word of God. Author Nate Pickowitz offers practical guidance for overcoming the hurdles that can often keep us from regular Bible study. You'll also be encouraged as you learn how other Christians throughout time maintain this crucial practice. Plus, there's a unique seven-year Bible reading plan to help you put what you learn into practice. We'd like to send you a copy today to express our gratitude for your support of this ministry. Whether you give a one-time donation or commit to ongoing support as a monthly Truth Ambassador, your financial gifts play a crucial role in helping us deliver bold, convicting Bible teaching to countless listeners. Will you come alongside us with a gift today? Here's the phone number to call, 888-644-8811. Or it might be easier to give online at ktt.org. And when you give, remember to request your copy of How to Eat Your Bible by Nate Pickowitz. If you prefer to mail your gift, our address is Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us again next time as we dive back into 1 Thessalonians 2. We'll be learning more about the power and importance of Scripture in our lives Thursday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.